so yeah, I will, I will talk about uh, Pietro Mantua, but I will also, before that, talk a bit about Albert of Saxony, which I, I see as a, as a background um, of this discussion of, of successive, successive entities. Uh, okay, so on, uh, on August 24, uh, 1497, uh, the two philosophers, the two main philosophers at uh, at Erfurt, Eulokos uh, Trutvetter and uh, Bartholomeus de Usingen, held a quadlibetal disputation in which they declared themselves um, uh, nominalists and followers of Occam. Uh, they published this uh, uh, disputation in different places. Uh, uh, Trutvetter published his in in his Sumulae Totius Logicae, and uh, Usingen published his part in, uh, in his uh, uh, treatise on natural philosophy. But uh, in his more programmatic uh, description, Trutfetter explains why, what, a, what a nominalist should hold, or rather, in, in negative terms, he, he he explains what a nominalist should reject. So he says there in the first parts, in the bits on, on, on categories, in his logic, he, he writes that there are no universal, relative, indivisible, privative, or successive entities, and no complex significabile, forms of the whole, or wholes. <clears throat> Now this is uh, uh, obviously the bit I'm interested in here is, uh, is the bit about successive entities. According to Trutfetter, then a nominalist should reject the idea of, of a successive entity. Now here, of course, he follows Occam strictly. Occam argues that there are no su successive entities. Uh, he writes in, in his physics, a successive entity never exists without having a part in the past and a part in the future. And then, and when a part of the successive entity exists, the successive entity exists. Now, such entities, Occam argues, cannot exist since they have parts that do not exist. That is, they have parts in the past and parts in the future. And um, Hence, they can't exist. Now, uh, it's the Trutfetter's declaration is interesting because um, when you start looking at what he says and what he himself then goes on to argue for in his work, he doesn't adhere to this strict form of nominalism or Occamism, uh, as he says, uh, that, that he does. Instead, uh, as the tradition after Occam seems to have done, uh, they are happy to embrace successive entities. So it was certainly not the view of the majority uh, uh, after Occam to claim that there are no successive entities. In fact, it turns out that most things are successive entities. Uh, there are very few things that are not. Um, and not just accidents uh, like motions, but, uh, but also substances are conceived of as successive entities. <clears throat> now, this view is, is, is is combined or, or particularly uh, emphasized because thinkers after Occam tended to think that a thing or a substance is its parts. And not just, uh, they weren't thinking about parts here, not, not just as integral parts or, or essential parts, but also parts proper, so, uh, material parts. So extended bits of, of matter, 
and form, which were obviously divisible, uh, most people argue. Uh, so, so what gradually comes out of this in this discussion after all in 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 authors like like, like Burdan, uh, Albert of Saxony, um, uh, Nicholas Oren, uh, uh, Marcellus of England, and and uh, also then, as we'll see, Peter of Mantua. It's a it's a new sort of conception. It's a new way of conceiving substance, particularly material substance. Uh, in in previous uh, writings, I've, I've I've called this a, a mariological account of substance. Uh, now, this new this idea of this way of conceiving substance brings with it uh, 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 problems, many many problems, many problems that that uh, for example, Aristotle in, in his in a traditional hylomorphism uh, introduced the, that very idea, the distinction between form and matter to solve. Uh, namely, they, they get problems of how to account for, for the identity over time of these of these uh, substances that make up their parts, their, uh, this, these mariological holes. So uh, an issue that uh, is not uh, uh, discussed much in Ockham, but is discussed in Burdan and also then in Albert of Saxony, it is, it's an idea of, of how to understand, given that you view uh, substance as these mereological poles, how, how do you account for the identity or the numerical sameness of this substance, of this thing, over time. Uh, Albert, in his physics, writes the following. Uh, something is said to be the same in number in three ways. In the first sense, something is said to be properly the same about which all parts remain the same, and it does not gain or lose a part. In this way, we say, that the heavens are the same in number as it has been for thousands of years. In the second sense, we say that something is the same in number, not totally, but partially, and not properly, namely, about which a principal part remains the same in number. In this way, we can say that a whole is the same in number by the identity of its principal part. In this way, a human being is the same in number and was so for the last 10 years. In the third sense, something is said to be the same in number, improperly so-called, because of the succession of its parts. And because of this continuous succession, it remains in a certain figure, disposition or form. In this way, we can call the river San the same, which has existed for hundreds of years, as well as other things whose parts are now different than they were. And in this sense, we say that the ship whose parts have been replaced is the same as before. <clears throat> so, Albert Hare account he, he uses the same terminology as Jordan also does in his physics, although his presentation is a little bit different. He says that something can be totally the same in number if no part is changed. If it has, if, if it's the whole substance is such that no part is gained or, or, or removed from it. Something can be partially uh, the same if one part of it remains the same. Most of it might change, 
uh, over time and parts are replaced, but one part remains the same, uh, then it is partially the same. And then, of course, it can be excessively the same. That is, parts are gradually replaced and added over time. This is an example of this. Or the, the ship of, of Thesis, who, whose parts are, are, are gradually replaced until nothing of it was the same. It's the same part as, as when it started. But nevertheless, through this successive change, we can say that it's the same ship. Um, so this is a problem. <clears throat> this problem change is um, is discussed uh, has been discussed. For example, Richard Cross uh, writes about this in, in one of his papers. He doesn't write about about Albert, but he writes about others. Among those, of course, Scotus, and he but he reflects on the problem and he says the following: Our problem post you is to explain the relevant explanatory continuity requirement for identity across time. The medieval's problem is different. They do not need to specify general continuity requirements because for them, there's a real sense in which substance, and indeed all permanent objects, lack temporal extent, and therefore any sort of temporal succession at all. The problems for the medievals is to ask to explain how substances can persist at all, rather than exist merely fleetingly. Now, uh, Richard is, is right here uh, to identify these, these different uh, problems, uh, but I think he's wrong to think that, that this problem that uh, he says is the post human or modern problem, of, of identity across time is not a medieval problem. I think Jordan and, and Albert, and as we will see also, also Peter Mantua thinks that certainly this is a problem. And how do you do this? How do you account for a substance that, success, that is a successive entity that, that uh, where, where parts are replaced over time, but it's still, but you still want to speak about this as one thing, as a, as a unit. Uh, <clears throat> so Albert of Saxony has to, um, and, and this is uh, 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 important background, has a very nuanced account of um, of uh, permanent and successive entities. Now he argues uh, in his physics that there are three kinds of permanent entities and two kinds of successive entities. Now there are permanent entities that are uh, totally permanent, as he calls them. And uh, totally permanent are entities that are permanent in both substance and disposition. And there's, there's um, the only example he gives is, is God uh, uh, of this. So there's um, maybe only one here. Uh, there's those permanent entities that are partially the same, the per partially permanent, sorry. Uh, and they are, par they are permanent in substance, but not in dispositions. And the example he gives here is are, are the heavens, who are, who are permanent in substance, but nevertheless they move, so their disposition changes. And then there are also permanent entities that are partially permanent in substance and not permanent in disposition. And uh, here he he um, he mentions animals and plants as as examples of this. 
So there's permanence, there's partial permanence in substance, but not, not in disposition. And there's then also two kinds of successive entities, uh, he thinks. There are simply uh, or simpliciter uh, successive entities that are successive both in substance and disposition, like the river, like the river, San, who is then also obviously uh, only identical successively. But then there are, there are successive entities that are successive secundum quid, as he calls it. And these are, are um, entities that sometimes remain and sometimes change. These are uh, that where something remains and something's changed. So there, here the example are, are, are animals and plants. They have, if you go back to the, uh, the, uh, the idea about how something is the same, they are then partially uh, the same. If they have a part, it doesn't change. So obviously there seems to be an overlap between these two. So uh, two here, number three in, on the successive, on the on the permanent entity seem to be seem to be the same. So we, you can say that an animal and a plant are successive entities secundum quid, but they are permanent entities uh, um, uh, partially uh, permanent entities. <clears throat> uh, and uh, you can also see that one and two of a permanent entity are, are totally the same. The third is partially the same and two of a successive entity is partially the same and uh, number one on a successive entity a simple successive entity is is um is just successively the same uh, over time <clears throat> now there are several ways uh, 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 he thinks you can understand uh, a successive simpliciter entity, Albert. You can think of it as a new entity created by God at every moment in time. Or you can think about it as a new entity in the sense of being a new whole at every moment in time. But some parts obviously continue across, across time. So... Uh, this uh, first view uh, he explains uh, in in his physics, and I guess it's a kind of it's, it's a kind of occasionalism where God recreates uh, uh, an entity at every moment in time. He says, "Let this be the first conclusion. It does not imply a contradiction for there to be a substance that is successive simpliciter. This is clear, indeed, perhaps." is the case that we continuously exist and are produced by the first cause in just the way that light is produced by a luminous body. So that just as light or a visible species of, con of color is continuously one and then another. So Socrates is continuously one and then another human being in such a way that on this conclusion, just as a human dep being depends on the first cause for conservation, so too, it depends on it for its being made. Uh, so, uh, on such a uh, on such an account of of, uh, of uh, successive uh, entities, of course, there's no issue with the beginning and ceasing of of such of, of such an entity, since it begins when God starts to create. And it ends when God stops recreating it. But if you view, uh, if you view a successive entity in, in a different way, in the second sense that I, that I um, mentioned above, there is a problem. And for that reason, Albert thinks that there are no substances are successive simpliciter. 
He says, it is proved in this way, since all substances are either eternal or begins to exist at some moment. If we're talking about the first case, then we're not talking about an entity that is successive simply. If we're talking in about the second sense case, then such an entity begins by generation, and as a consequence, will cease to be by a generation. If it is an entity successive simpliciter after the generation by which it began, and it continues to be generated, then after this it will generate and further generate. In this way, it will never stop generating completely, which is false. So, for this reason, he thinks that simple uh, simpliciter successive entity. Uh, he. Uh, And, and the real successive entity doesn't really have an end, at least not a clear end. It continues successively, maybe until we stop talking about it or stop referring to it as, as that entity, whatever entity it was. There's no clear end, ending anyway. Of such an entity. So for that reason, he thinks there are no substances that are simple uh, successive entities. He's, he thinks, however, that many substances are successive secundum quid. Here are all animals, all plants, and um, Uh, there's a there's an issue whether where where one could one could and be, and and Albert is not quite clear on that where where uh, where um, uh, uh, humans lie, but he doesn't mention humans as a secundum quid. So maybe humans are partially permanent uh, entities for him. Some accidents, however, are successive simplicities and have no permanence, he thinks, such as uh, uh, um, sound and motion and time, while he thinks, for example, cold and heat are, su are, are successive secundum quid. Now, there are many, many philosophical in interesting questions here that I could go on to discuss. Uh, my time is, is running a little short though, but I wanted to mention one that comes up. And that's how to think about uh, terms, particularly absolute uh, substance terms in, in when, when we think of, of entities uh, in the way we do here. Uh, in the physics uh, in question eight, Albert says, it follows that the name Socrates is a common term. This is false and contrary to grammar and logic. The consequence is proved in the following way, since it signifies several humans, not only successively, but also truly simultaneously, by which the parts of Socrates taken together are Socrates, and in the same way, the whole is still Socrates, even without one finger. So there's an issue, of course, if you think of Socrates as being his parts, is what does the term Socrates pick out? Uh, uh, we, we think from logic and, and grammar that Socrates is a, is a discrete, absolute, uh, singular, proper name. Uh, but if you think of it, that it's picking out the whole, which is constituted by its parts, then it's picking out a lot of parts. Or if you think about it as Socrates existing successively over time, you have to think about the term Socrates picking out several different Socrates over time, which makes the signification of, of the term Socrates not, not singular. 
uh, and and certainly not absolute. It makes it it makes it uh, it makes it quantitative. And this is a this is a known problem uh, discussed by by many of these authors. Jordan brings it up in his The Anima. Albert brings it up in, in, in other works. He talks about it in his famous logic, Paratimis Logica, and the chapter about universals, because he's wondering there, isn't Socrates also a universal term? Uh, he talks about it in his Sophismata, where he asks the question, the whole of Socrates is the parts of Socrates, and what consequences does that have? If this is true, then it follows that the term human being and animal are not absolute terms, but quantitative. If this is true, then it follows that the name Socrates is a counter. Because by imposition, it is imposed to signify several parts of a human. Now, the problem here is, is that you have, if you, if you follow a, an Occamistic or, a, or an Aristotelian idea where the, the signification of the term supposed to derive from the, the substance itself. You, you need to ask how that signification sort of comes about. Is it a causal account or is it something else? Now, I've argued elsewhere that these people, and I think it's true, when you look at, at, uh, at them, they start to rethink how, how imposition and, um, and um, signification uh, of these terms come about for this very reason. So instead of thinking uh, about it as it deriving from the thing itself, think about it as coming from from the the imposer, and and, and as such, you can you can think about uh, uh, these terms as singular and not qualitative. But but it is a it is a problem. Uh, i my time is almost out. I want to now so this dragged out. Uh, uh, I want to turn to Peter Mantua then. So Peter Mantua lived. He might not be well known to, to many people. But he died at 1399. He's first mentioned as a student in Padua in 1389. He taught in Bologna. Uh, uh, in in the late in the nine in the thirteen nineties to to his death. Now he's mostly famous for his logic work, his, his large logic compendium. But he also wrote this book called the Primo et Ultimo Instanti, which is a which is a, a really a work on 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 successive entities and and and, uh, and uh, how to understand. Uh, uh, Physics and mathematics in relation to these kinds of uh, interviewing uh, uh, substance in this way it is a clear, a strong rejection of of our Aristotelian hylomorphism. Even though it's less known, it, it had some some influence on, on in the fourteen, in the fifteenth and sixteenth century. It's referred to by Gaetano di Tiene. Aki, Alessandro Achillini and, and also Pietro Pomponazzi. Um, it is clearly in this Jordanian Albert tradition, but it has knowledge of, obviously he has knowledge of the Oxford calculators. And it's a fascinating mix of natural philosophy and science, natural, natural science and, and, and philosophy. These, these go together. And the interconnections here are, are, are explicit. Now he takes this principle that I've already mentioned that a substance or a thing is part. He takes this as, as very fundamental. He writes, for example, no thing, no thing can have other parts than the, one, than the ones it has. No substance can have other parts than it has. And by the same reasoning, no accident or something else can have other parts. And they have, uh, and this this holds for form as well as matter. Uh, in in uh, by varying the total matter of a composite having an extended substantial form, the composite is varied, of which it is the matter. From this it follows that by varying parts of the matter or the whole, which has an extended substantial form, the whole composite is varied. Likewise, by varying parts of the substantial form. Or the substantial 
the whole composite is val is varied. Uh, now he mentions uh, uh, Socrates, uh, the problem here. If a part of matter is varied, then the whole natural composite is var varies. Then it follows that nothing is a, a discrete term, nor that Socrates remains Socrates for time. And neither does Plato remain Plato over time, and so forth. So here, here then there's a longer discussion on this issue as well. How how Socrates uh, can be uh, uh, a proper name, a discrete term. Uh, uh, for example, he rejects what I've uh, uh, spelled out as sort of Arab's solution to, to um, how Socrates or an animal or a plant or a natural substance can, can exist and remain the same over time non-successively, namely that a part remains the same. Uh, he says, but perhaps it can be said that this part remains the same because a major and principal part of it remains, and this is sufficient for it to remain the same number. Now, this it follows from his previously accepted sort of principle, of course, that this can't hold because for him, the whole is is um, is uh, is what 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 the, the substance is the whole and all of its parts. So even if one part remains the same, other parts change and are replaced. Uh, so in 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 that respect, nothing increases or decreases. Uh, uh, Peter thinks. If when parts of the substantial form is varied, it follows that the whole composite varies, and it follows that no inanimate composite can increase or decrease, distinguishing augmentation and diminution from rarefaction and compensation, since no such thing can be diminished without some of its parts being corrupted or removed. So no substance can uh, decrease or increase, or no substance can remain the same and where, where, where parts are, are, are replaced. Now, to finish off here, I, I just want to point to this, which I think is Peter's sort of original view, very original uh, view and problematic view. I'm not sure um, how it, um, how it can be maintained, really. He may um, we, we have a problem with the sound, Henrik. Um, that might come okay. from the... I, I, I see that you're using um, um, earphones, and sometimes Bluetooth creates that. It, it might be the cause of... I don't know. So if I take this off then. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, uh, just to end here before my time is completely up, uh, uh, he makes this distinction between augmentation and diminution on the one hand and rarefaction and condensation on the other. Now, Augmentation and diminution has to do with adding or losing a part uh, and uh, rarefaction and condensation has to do with the sort of quantity, quantity the parts uh, remains the same, but um, the volume changes so that it, you can think about something as, 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 as decreasing in volume and increasing in volume without actually bits the parts changing. Now, uh, Peter believes that a substance never changes a part. So on Albert's view of change, he thinks that a substance must always be totally the same. And this goes for all substances in, in nature, not just, uh, not just God or, or the heavens as, as, uh, as Albert <clears throat> uh, 
uh, talked about it. Yeah. So, <clears throat> but Peter seems to think that given this, we can still talk about there being some change in terms of rarefaction and condensation in a substance without, so there can be some, some change to a substance without there being, uh, being, um, being uh, uh, without parts being exchanged. So uh, I'm gonna end there. Uh, uh, there's lots to be said about this, um, uh, about this treatise, which is very difficult, but also very, very interesting where he really tries to work out uh, this, this uh, uh, view of, 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 of substance. Uh, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna end there just to hope you heard most of that anyway. <laughs>